Good morning. So uh, this is the talk outline. We'll start out with something hopeful. We're going to wallow through something with we'll despair. And we'll end up with hope again. So, uh, you know, I think the world of Graham, and uh, it's always a pleasure to, to be involved in anything he's involved in. But amazingly, he's misnamed this conference. It shouldn't be the handheld conference, but the headheld conference. Oh, there it is. Okay. So, all right, I take it back. Um, so this is Pascaline. This is in Kigali in Rwanda. This is the capital city. And uh, her school has about 3,300 students. Last year, they had 2,700 students. And as this was one of the first schools to get laptop, they got another 600. There was actually a lot more, but we ran out of space. Um, it's really quite amazing. And, you know, so the first time I went to Rwanda was two years ago. And we started working there with a, just 70 of the prototype laptops in a village about an hour and a half outside of Kigali. And what was quite amazing right from the beginning, and these laptops, they were prototypes. They were really buggy. They had a lot of troubles. And the kids just went forward. And my first visit to the school, after a few weeks, they were explaining to the Minister of Science and Technology basically how it was that they were sending email around the world, how the satellite communication worked. And in some ways, people tell you this isn't quite possible, that all the things that have to happen before you really get kids to do interesting things with technology. And those of you that work with kids, which I guess is everybody here, know kids are the least of the issues. The, the kids just really take to it. And, you know, in fact, just a... Uh, you know, last Saturday we were doing something and some kid goes and is, goes to the MTV website and we say, how do you even know about the MTV website, right? How do you know about MTV? It's not like there's 6%, 6% there's of Rwanda has electricity. And I think that means 6% of the possible connections when you do the numbers and the, pop, and the population. 6%, people don't have televisions, right? It, so how does this spread? But people do find things that are interesting. People find and people are creative and they really find a way to do things. And so, you know, we started, I mean, the work at MIT around children and learning started with Seymour Papert 40 something years ago. And 40 something years ago, Seymour talked then about the day when every child would be programming a computer. And 40 years ago, everybody said, well, that's just damn crazy. You know, computers in the 60s cost millions of dollars. They, you know, blew their own, they needed enough air conditioning to blow their own holes and personal holes in the ozone layer. Uh, you know, they fill up half a room this size. And, you know, they said maybe a school system will have a computer, but not every child. And, you know, that came to pass. What hasn't yet really come to pass are the really interesting things to do with it. We see glimpses, we see more and more. But we see that, and what we did, right, so we tried to convince industry forever to make low-cost computers for, for children, for learning, for the whole world, and for years, industry ignored us, so we started our own non nonprofit to do this, and now there's almost two million out in the world. Things are really moving. We're at a very different stage of what we're doing, where now the stage is like, how do you really show the kind of benefits that can happen from doing this? So, this... This is uh, the school that she goes to. This is Kalgoogoo School. There's, there were about 75 kids per class. What the government did was that they split the day in half. So they've gotten the averages down to around 40 or 42, but kids are going to school only for like four hours per day. Now, in some ways, that's not so bad because what happens in the average school is really, it just blows your mind. Uh, someone this morning was just mentioned that uh, had a picture from when we were in Haiti and we're in a classroom with my colleague and good friend Edith Ackerman, probably some of you know her, if you don't, you should, she's wonderful. We're in this classroom in Haiti and we're in the back, 75 kids in this classroom, they have no paper, they have no pencil, but the national curriculum calls that they're going to be doing multiplication of one two-digit number by another two-digit number, and that's what they're doing, and they're doing it in their heads. Okay, that's fine. It actually, you can think of really a lot of interesting mathematical ideas that you come up with in terms of place value, uh, you know, in terms of estimation, in terms of how would you know what the right number is, in terms of algorithms to kind of figure something out and make it approachable. But that's not what happens. The teachers 
in most of the world are, there are victims themselves, that they don't have really much of an education either, they're put out in front of children, and then they're told to teach as though there's some type of, you know, master teacher here. And even the master teachers, if we see, that's an obsolete method for you looking at what it would mean to be a master teacher 40 years ago should be extremely different from what we mean by a master teacher today. But we're forcing this paradigm of education onto people that we should be moving away from ourselves, and yet they're so far, you know, not having the resources from being able to do this. Now, having a device with every child actually gives us a chance to overcome most of these barriers. And so what we have here is, this is Hervé on the right, he's in his low 20s. He is working to teach children programming, and in this case, they're programming their own games. So we get this going as fast as we can. Get you to use the computer in creative, constructive, and collaborative ways. Make things, express your ideas, do things. And, you know, this has been research that's been going on for a while. When you have kids making games, they're going to make interesting kind of games, whether we start them out with, like, making Pong or making Chase or all kind of things. And, you know, the math, the science, the things that come in, as uh, James G. was speaking about yesterday, you see the deep theory that kids are really going to go, the problem solving, all the kind of things that we might label 21st century skills, kids really get when they're playing these kinds of games, and they really engage. And when you get kids to make games or extend games that are already made, it's incredible what they'll do and how much time they'll spend doing it. I don't know if I mentioned it already, but Pascaline, we, we run extra sessions on Saturday at different places around the city. Pascaline and a bunch of her friends walk two hours every day to get to the session, they're at the session, and then they walk two hours back to go away. I mean, what's striking from me, from working in the States to working outside, is that in the States, so much of the effort is to engage kids in the first place. There's a strong sense of entitlement, there's a sense of being cool, there's a sense of like not engaging, that you can't quite do that. And outside, it's really spectacularly different. I mean, these are kids that are really just spending as much time as they can doing work that's really quite difficult but there's really a sense of inclusion and empowerment as they do it. Um, Sylvia, who works with us from Brazil, this is the same school. And so we're leading these kind of what they call curiosity investigations. We just start brainstorming with kids. What are you curious about? Uh, this group was curious, where does the sun go when it's not in Rwanda? Interesting in Rwandan mythology, uh, God is away from Rwanda during the day and comes back at night, although I might have gotten the sign wrong. It might be the other way around. So, they're out there, you see they have the cameras. What's really great of having the screen that you can see in the daylight is that they can actually do this and see what they're doing. They're, they just followed everything they could and used the device in every way that they could to just follow up. We're building up quite a library of the different kind of investigations that they're doing, not with the idea that anybody should do the same type of investigation, but just as like, this is really a much better thing to do with kids in the school than, than not. Uh, they're making their own digital newspapers, in this case it's for the service of the community, so they're really researching and putting together the ideas of what's important for their community. Uh, it's great that uh, you, you see this happen everywhere. Everywhere, like BBC was just down there to film. Uh, really, I think the, what they did was very fair, it was really quite nice. Uh, what happens every time is as soon as somebody walks in with a camera, the kids all turn on the camera in their laptop and take pictures back, and then they publish back at you. This is just incredible, right? It's really quite fantastic because what you don't quite see is for the most part, most of these kids had no voice whatsoever. In a lot of ways, they were invisible to the modern world. Things that we've seen, so laptops have been in schools now since the beginning of 2008. Uh, it's ramping up, Uruguay much more, Peru, Rwanda, and then quite a number of other countries that have around 10,000 or so of the laptops. And everywhere you see, school enrollment goes up, school attendance goes up. In fact, we like to say the school attendance is above 100% because kids actually show up at other times. You know, they're really there. And the school then is re-emerging, or emerging, as a center of the community. And that's really quite astounding. And so when a lot of the fear beforehand by some critics was that talking about one-to-one, -one, are you becoming, are you making kids like more antisocial? 
And it's really quite different. There really has become a means to really engage with people in your community as well as at a distance. And the school becoming a center primarily because the connectivity is better at the school. Uh, I mean, no electricity, no connectivity in, into the home, so we do what we can in terms of spreading connectivity. But it's best in the school, and so kids come back, and they come back with their families. Kids are teaching their parents how to read. It's quite astounding. Excuse me, astounding the kind of things that are happening. We have a decrease in grade repetition, there's a decrease in problems at the school. You know, so things that are, you know, not being taught are really being learned because there really is value. So, on the more academic side, the amount of reading and writing that's going on is just exponentially higher. Kids are communicating, they have a reason to, but they're communicating because they want to. Like they're communicating, they're finding people. You know, I get more email from kids in Rwanda and other kind of countries now than it's like, it's impossible to keep up, but this is a great thing, so we're kind of distributing how we deal with that. Uh, but really with the idea of like, we don't want these kids just to be consumers of what's produced outside, but really becoming technologically fluent in a serious way. So computer literacy got degraded so much by saying, you know, oh, it's like, you know, how to use a keyboard or how, you know, a Windows file system works, or what's a CPU. In fact, it gets quite outmoded. You know, what they used to teach is computer literacy because the technology moves forward. But really the idea of like, we would consider someone fluent or literate with text because they can read, they write, they understand the idea, they can express the idea, they can get out the meaning. And this is what we're really trying to do with the technology. Can you create, can you express ideas, can you understand other ideas? And where the computer is essential is that ideas that are really difficult to grasp with paper and pencil become appropriable, understandable, expressible, you know, through using the technology. Things that are tough in terms of like, you know, we look at problems of the day, it's like thinking about things that are highly dynamic or thinking about things that are di deeply interconnected. You know, these are things that are almost impossible to understand or like with very many levels of abstraction away without this kind of medium of t computer technology. And this is what we're trying to put in the hands of kids for them to really do. And these are the ideas in schools that are really quite essential. What's not happening is the curriculum is not keeping pace with what's possible. And so what this does is it kind of demeans the technology so we only use the technology to try and teach the old concepts in somewhat of a better way. And so we use the technology still primarily as broadcast, as just presenting information to kids. It still keeps them passive. It still is just based on information. And it doesn't really get the active engagement. So when we talk about, as a number of the speakers have, of the engagement of working on the interests of the kids, that that's where you're really going to get the connection. That being active, that being expressive, that really collaborating, this is what the technology gives us. But what's lacking are the tools materials and types of ideas for doing things with this. And so that's where the work needs to go. Uh, how am I on time? I'm totally out. So go through some of the despair. This is in Cameroon. This school in Cameroon is getting laptops in the next couple months. Uh, you know, we're, they've already been working with the teachers. And so there's 95 kids on average in this classroom, right? They, they actually have two teachers, although one teacher walks around with this big pole, right? because it's hard to keep discipline over 95 kids. And you know, so you go in, you go, man, what are they doing otherwise? But this is the reality in so many schools around the world. And it doesn't have to be that way. And I believe, and I've got writing on this, so I'm not gonna bore you with it here, but about if you wanted to look at what's the most cost-effective way to really bring a high-quality learning environment to everybody in the shortest possible period of time, where it's not just a matter of access to computers or computer labs where maybe a kid gets 10 minutes a week on a computer, but really something that fundamentally changes what they can do for learning, I think the case is pretty straightforward that laptops or connected technology it's going to be the best possible way to work on all the fronts at the same time. Because what you have, all right, this is some of the work we do with teachers. Uh, like in most schoolyards, I'm sure, here in, 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 uh, in the UK, uh, you have your banana trees out in the yards. And you, you go out and you can study these things. And so we have them go out and it's like, let's study. You know, what is this environment? What are you really doing there? We're doing a lot of storytelling. We're doing a lot of capture of data. We're doing a lot of environmental studies. But we're really doing their creation of local material. 
and what can they do, and how would you study it, and how do you start to understand biodiversity? Rwanda well, is quite an amazing place. You got it's the Great Lakes region, it's the Nile Basin is there, the Congo Basin is there. It's really quite amazing, and you know, studying the hurricanes. And it used to be people would say that. Uh, in the, that hurricanes would form off the coast of West Africa. Now you start to see it's actually probably more in the Sahara, but we actually don't collect meteorological data in any great detail in Africa. There's a tremendous wealth, and so we're getting the kids out there really to study biodiversity, to study weather, to really do some research that's not happening at any other level, but it's possible because we're getting up so that, you know, by the end of this, no, early next year we'll have several hundred thousand laptops around in different countries in Africa. Kids are really starting to do things, they're starting to connect. Teachers are really starting to do things, but we're really starting from a very basic way, working with the teachers, but it's tough. And so in Rwanda, you have two and a half million kids in primary school, more or less there's 50,000 teachers. And if you want to say, how would you do enough work with all those teachers and with the teachers coming into the system, such that you'd really change the educational system, it's just going to really take a long time. There's no real shortcut to that. But given that kids are only in school for four hours, and you get them devices, and you get teachers' devices, and you get connectivity, we can really rethink how we organize learning and what we can do because it's much better as we get kids and teachers really active and studying and working on things. It builds up much quicker than then doing these horrific training, teacher training courses that you see where we teach them how to give lessons in PowerPoint when there's no electricity in the classroom and you can't display it anyway. You know, it's mind-boggling, yet that's the kind of thing that happens. So the bigger part of my despair is what we're really doing there. It's a different kind of colonialism, and it's really sad. What you're seeing is that you get banks and funding agencies that are forcing countries into doing things that demonstrably don't work. Those of you that are researchers and have to apply for grants, the last, I don't know, let's say 10 years have changed where we have to give much more data about how we assessing what we're doing, how are we going to show that it really works. On the other hand, banks and funding agencies, their track record is abysmal. And yet they still force countries into doing things that don't work. Same thing, a lot of, all right, there's some, I, I'm throwing everybody into one bucket. There's some places that do some excellent work. You know, so, but you see this kind of way of forcing people into things that really don't work and it's really going to set them back. If we really take seriously the importance of quality education for everybody and we look at our planet becoming more and more interconnected and the ways that what people do in each place impacts other places. When if you look at spreads of disease or anything like that, it's really the intelligence of the planet is what needs to go up. And we can do that. We can do things that are really much better. We can get the price of devices down. We can really make that available. That's not so hard. What is hard is like, how do we really improve the quality of the learning experience for everybody? And that's what we have to do. I'm throwing in predatory corporations there, too, who really just treat children as a market. And then they sell things also that don't work. You know, so you see these kind of things that come down about, here's your lesson in PowerPoint, here's this thing, and you get the rhetoric about it, which is really quite lovely, but then you look in practice and it doesn't work. And you see the kind of influence which often winds up to be illegal just so that a corporation can make a sale, and it's at the expense of the educational experience of the child. They push things, they get, you know, whatever they call it, you know, sales points, talking points, and it's really rather disturbing and it really does happen. We find it's kind of funny at OPC that whatever country we go in, we can give you a timetable from when certain companies are gonna show up, they'll do exactly what we do, and they won't go to the neighboring country, they won't do the same kind of thing, they have so many more resources, they really could do quite a bit, and yet it doesn't happen. So, and I think the last thing which I really wanna do is this idea of colonializing children, which is that, you know, Kids are really quite astounding. You, we hear a lot as we talk about what we're doing about saying, oh, you have to do all the work with the teachers before you can do anything with children because the children will go faster than the teachers and then the teachers will be afraid and they won't let anything happen. And you think, what's the underlying logic behind this? You know, it has to be the goal of education that every successive generation kind of goes beyond the previous. That's got to be our goal, is that kids should surpass us. They should really learn. And what we don't see, it's really a matter of control that people are nervous about, 
But when the control is done by denying knowledge or using force, it's, it's the wrong kind of control. What we really do see, we don't see the breakdown in authority with children because of what they can do with computers any more than any of us who rely on our children or our grandchildren to help us with any new technology. It strengthens the bond, and we've seen that over and over in a lot of these families which have, which have really you know, serious resource problems. You know, the kids, as they teach their parents how to read, or they use the technology for the benefit of the family, they use the technology for the benefit of the community, they just are happier and they're doing things even if they're playing games, and they're not causing trouble. You know, it really strengthens the bond in the community because it really is empowering. And letting the ideas and the creativity of children really come forward and really being taken seriously, this really works, as opposed to saying, okay, here's where you're learning today, you can get this little bit next day, and we gotta open this up much more. So there is hope, you know, that, that what, you know, again, from pulling from some of the other speakers earlier in the conference, is one of the things is like kids are in some ways becoming conscientious objectors to school, but not to learning that when they are doing things that are really active, exciting, as much as they go deep into their games or whatever it might be, they're really engaging. It's strong intellectual activity. It's very social as they collaborate with each other. They are really seeing, it's like they have this powerful learning experience as they're doing something. They know it's tough. It's not easy how you solve problems in some of these games. It's not easy thinking about communicating as you do with, like, and we see our kids communicating across multiple languages. It's mind boggling. They do it, they go forward. It's really quite wonderful. And then they go to school and then they're bored silly. And so you see it that, you know, there's is this shift that what kids are going to do, but what they're able to do. And one of the best things about why we made a laptop instead of, let's say, computer labs or desktop machines is that goes with the kid everywhere. They're not just stuck to this kind of, you know, obsolete methodology that we use in school that just, you know, tells kids stuff. The computational fluency, you know, you're seeing kids are what they're creating, these games. You know, it's like we like to say, I'm going to have 120,000 laptops in Rwanda this year. We'll be up to 2.5 million in it within three years. Let's say 10% of these kids become good programmers. Well, that's 250,000 kids at the you know, few years. That's really pretty amazing. That's just one place. The kind of things that they're going to do, the kind of creativity, it's really quite a style. I mean, you, if you've been to Africa, there's so many wonderful things with the music and the dance, the creative spirit, the friendliness, the understanding social, the way people know how to work together. There's really many wonderful things. And so we're going to have the benefit of the world of enabling this kind of creativity to spread for everybody. And then how this exchange is going to be. Rwanda's interesting. It's hard to believe that there was such a you know, the genocide occurred only 15 years ago. You go there, it's a spectacular place. People are friendly. How could this happen, right? I, I don't understand it, you know, I really don't. But one thing that's there is the strong commitment that this type of thing should never happen again. That a major part of education has to be the growing of your own sense of who you are combined with the respect for the human rights of everybody else. And this is one thing that we're really trying to do, and there are a number of NGOs that are working there uh, in the Genocide Memorial with the Aegis Foundation, there's Search for Common Ground, there's strong work inside the ministry, that really to start to go, that we take this really quite seriously. And it's really quite wonderful to see that you really can do this. And we think about, all right, what do we do? What do we have to do to really help bring people together such that you really can engage in such a way not just superficially, in terms of working with others and respecting each other's understanding their history. So we're doing these kind of projects around our own culture, our own history, but with the idea of like we exchange, we talk, what mythologies do you have? How do you see you know, connections over there? So again, instead of telling people this, these are the kind of things the kids are working on. So what are we asking from you? Make tools for other people to use or make tools for them to make tools. Don't just make you know, content that's just gonna still come down and just basically presenting information to people. But give people tools and then give them great examples of the kind of things that you can do with those tools. Instantiate these powerful ideas. Really get it going so that when we see these great projects that some of the people presented, you know, it's like, yeah, this is great. Let's steal that. Let's make that open. Let's share these ideas. You know, these kind of inspirational examples of what we can really do. And then the last is, as we're getting connectivity, let's connect each other up. 
I've changed my view of what it meant for access to me. Access to the technology is certainly necessary, but it's out of most people's experience how to do strong research, how to really find what you really want to do, how to analyze the information. But what I saw and it started in Thailand more than 10 years ago was that people really miss access to expertise. And this is true even in our own schools as we really try and say, you want to connect kids to good writers or good poets, good com composers, good mathematicians, good scientists, good computer scientists, good engineers, et cetera, et cetera. And we want to connect kids to that so that you can do things in the company of other people who have passion and expertise in this area. And this is what we can do. And so we challenge the teachers we work with to say, tell us something you love to do and how did you learn to do it? And they all say, oh, you know, it's always, it's learning by doing, it's very social, they learn with other people, they get in, they do more, they never think they've learned everything, they're constantly improving, they know they're gonna fail for a long period of time, they put in the time. So we say, okay, let's think about school in exactly this way. Let's really think about it much more as doing, collaborating, not worrying about mistakes, just going forward. And so we have that chance. So what we really hope is more of these kids and more of these schools, more of these communities get their laptops. They have the chance to interact with you on the things that you're passionate about. And then this is the kind of thing that's going to really improve the intelligence level and really make for a much more livable world. Thank you. Well, that was great, a bit of passion. It struck me that almost everything David said there, I was thinking, well, this should be true in my school here in the developed world. <laughs> almost exactly the same set of messages. We have time for some questions. So once again, if you can wait uh, on the microphone coming to you, just stick your hand up. One on the left in the middle here. That's it. Uh, hello, Andrew Watt from Edinburgh. Um, it really picks up the point that David just made because I'm a huge supporter of the one laptop per child concept. I just have a worry lurking behind it all. You talked about the 250,000 programmers that potentially could come out of the program. And let's suppose that happens, and they all disappear off to the big cities to be programmers. Who's left in the existing rural economy that, 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 that's there? And the girl who walks two hours to get extra tuition, compare that with the disaffected children we see in Western society. Is there a danger we're going to export that sort of attitude and radically change aspects of, of, of the culture there, which, to my way of thinking, are, are actually probably superior to what we've ended up with in the Western world? Yeah, both those points are essential. Uh, and, and we really do worry exactly about that. Now, migration, both, or emigration, and migration to capital cities. I mean, migration to capital cities in the developing world is a huge, huge issue, where the rural areas destabilized and the urban areas become unlivable. We, we really are trying to do, and again, it's a matter of connectivity, is that it gives the opportunity for distributing the economic base inside a country so that it isn't only dependent upon you know, uh, physical bodies. So we make a focus towards really emphasizing developing local community, the kind of thing you can do there. It's going to be interesting as we work in the different countries. Rwanda, for some reason, hasn't had the strong migration to the capital that lots of other countries have, although I believe it's probably starting. And it's hard to collect data in almost all the countries. So what we're really trying to do is to say, can you create, what can you do, can you build an economic basis such that it becomes a good choice to remain in, your, in the rural areas or in your local communities? People chose not to because there was no economic future. Uh, you know, international agencies pushed so many places out of you know, towards cash crop farming that, you know, then people, even in their farming areas and fertile areas, didn't have enough to eat. We've done a lot of really horrible things. We're trying not to be another horrible thing done to people by emphasizing what are the kind of things and to build the strength inside the local area because as you talk to people, you see they'd much prefer to be in the home community than otherwise. And the other, you know, I, I, it's, it's a complex question that I, I, I really struggle with. 
which is that what are we bringing in from outside? How are we going to corrupt things? There are a lot of things that are better, you know, in these places than what we might experience in our home, you know, localities. And, you know, people really do want the technology. You see the kind of things that happens with children, the kind of things they're able to do. What we're really trying to do by emphasizing creating and collaborating with the technology and this kind of local focus is to way that they grow their own. So we're not imposing, it's not let's say a formal tech transfer model that we're saying here's the technology, here's how to use it, or here's education and this is what you need to do, but really with this idea that you can get by democratizing the technology that can you create the things that really are meaningful to you, that benefit you there, and see that it evolves. Uh, but yeah, I mean we really have to take those points really seriously, I absolutely agree. We have time for one other question. Can I see? There's one right at the back on the right hand side there. Yeah. Can't hear you, sorry. Yeah, Andrew Kasten, uh, Darlene University, Sweden. Uh, when I was in Uganda recently and talking to people about setting up uh, collaboration at university level for teacher training, the major problem was uh, connectivity and bandwidth. Not even at the biggest universities did they have the bandwidth so that we could actually collaborate. And that's surely where the potential is for, for Africa in, in uh, learning computers, is getting into collaboration between North and South. So how do you see the future for, for, uh, for getting bandwidth to these villages in Rwanda and Uganda and all the other countries in, in Eastern Africa? Yeah, uh, bandwidth, electricity, it's all true. I mean, the new cable just came in and landed uh, last month, I think. And so it's going to get a little bit better in East Africa as it's been going. And I think a lot of these problems are chicken and egg kind of problems. People would say, well, there you know, aren't enough devices, so why do we need connectivity? Or you know, we don't really have these things, so people don't create materials for when you have classrooms anywhere in the world that are really one-to-one -one or every kid with a device. And so I think we kind of tried to look at we're breaking that log jam. People are going to, you know, there is going to be more demand. People are going to get really innovative about the kind of things you can do. And, you know, I, I, I just see this as like, you know, different aspects of an ecology are just going to help each other and, and move things forward. And it's certainly true. I mean, that, uh, you know, power, connectivity, you know, the expertise that you really want to get, it's lacking. But it, it's really going to get better. And I think as more things go in, it's going to create more people with demand. And then you see around cell phones and all these kind of things, all these great new businesses, real ideas, you know, pop up that actually help in local solutions. The creativity is quite amazing as people find ways around their, you know, limitations and resources. And of the things, going back to the previous question, you know, that, that are really, you know, you wonder are you going to lose? One of the best things that we see in rural areas is a kind of hacking spirit. And I mean hacking in the positive sense. Right, you know, I'm just going to get in. I'm going to figure out a way to make this work, and that comes out of lack of resources. You can't call the electrician, or you can't call the plumber. You figure these things out. You don't have the right tool. You don't have the right part. You look at it as a system, and you make things work. Around cell phones, you got all these kids running around, you know, teenagers, young adults that would be unemployed, selling airtime. In Rwanda, you prepay electricity on your cell phone, which is also prepaid, as a way of getting it out there, and it gets things to places where there is no infrastructure. Uh, yeah, you know, the, in the earlier photo, you saw the girl, she had a little USB key. The kind of things that they're doing and moving things around and how they share it, it's really quite amazing. I worry actually that we're, the bigger thing I worry about is are we going to, as more and more comes, are we going to lose that kind of spirit as, you know, you just get more of a sense of entitlement and things. But it, I'm hopeful. I mean, things are really moving. You see the kind of ways that kids take to this, their parents take to this, the teachers take to this, the kind of things that they're able to do in a short period of time. A lot of the technical problems I know we're going to solve. Or the other way, a good friend of mine used to say, uh, with any problem, he was a consultant in an AI consulting company, was said, 90% of the problem is the hard stuff, the technical stuff. And the other 90% is the soft stuff, the people stuff. And so we're kind of working our way through both of those now. OK, uh, we'll stop there. Could I have a round of applause for David? Yeah. 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 Yeah.